to the cloud. All right. Um, okay. Like I said, I think we'll get a few more, but wanted to jump in, be respectful of time. Wanted to give the biggest thank you to Ronnie for joining us. Um, we have a kind of extra special connection introduction that'll happen in just a moment. So I'm not going to steal any thunder. Um, but we've had a lot of newer folks join Keystone even in the past month, two months, six months. So I wanted to give a, a quick, um, a little bit of context on what we're trying to do as a firm. I think in particular right now, we're at a really exciting time for DE and I at Keystone. We just welcomed Nicole Sylvester, who's a new L&D leader and who's on the call, who will be sort of taking over that strategy. And I feel like as a team, we've really been getting more and more sophisticated and thoughtful with every year that goes by about how we can really embed diversity and inclusion into kind of all facets of Keystone and not just engagement opportunities, not just policies, but instead having a really comprehensive program that touches everything from recruiting to marketing to the way we, to the way we engage with clients and to the way we engage with each other. So to that end, um, one particular piece, and ooh, shout out to Isra, uh, one particular piece of our um, DE&I strategy currently is making sure we provide engagement opportunities for us as a firm internally to be having these important conversations and these dialogues and to be amplifying the voices of folks who we are celebrating when we're celebrating something like Native American, Native American Heritage Month. So we've had some wonderful speakers even in the past. I've only been here since February and we've had just such some great, great guests to Keystone. Um, and we will continue to do so in terms of making sure we're bringing folks in who, who can share with us and teach us and inspire kind of continuous conversation and action. So. With that, um, I'll make one more plug. I have to give a thank you to Shelby and to Ali, who were super, super instrumental in, you know, kind of this process in terms of, you know, really making the speaker series happen. So if anyone else wants to get involved, please feel free to reach out to myself, to Nicole. Um, we'd love to talk through sort of, you know, what the upcoming strategy looks like and how we could plug you in if that's something you're passionate about. So with that, I'm going to flip it to Shelby um, and I will stop talking. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Um, so yeah, we're welcoming uh, Ronnie with us. So a little bit of, I guess, my story of, of our great connection. So Ronnie is the aunt of my fiance, Alec, who's also joining us. So in um, when Rachel had mentioned looking, they were looking for a Native American speaker for the speaker series, I thought of her immediately because I know I've learned so much through um, talking with her and also him about involvement in Cherokee Nation. And I thought, what better way than to bring them here? Uh, I know a lot of the, the work we do and is, or listen is about experts and academics, but Ronnie has an extensive, um, both corporate experience and, and now uh, experience in uh, leading her own firm. So I thought very entrepreneurial, <laughs> as well, which I think fits with the Keystone ethos. Um, but I'm just really happy she was uh, able to able to join us uh, today. And I know she'll give a, a good background of, of herself. Thank you, Shelby. Is it my turn? Yes, it I'll is. You, it's all your turn. I'll stop uh, my screen share. OK, and I will try to start mine. How about that? maybe if I can here. All right, tell me if everybody can see that. Yes, we can. All right, awesome. Um, CO, CO, uh, I am so very pleased to be here. Thank you, Shelby, and thank you, Rachel. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me. Um, I uh, don't usually do this kind of engagement, so it's kind of fun uh, to be able to just kind of share my story. Uh, I am Ronetta Keeter Briggs, Ronnie um, in business, and I am the granddaughter of, um, let's see, John Dale, Adeline Dale Keeter, and then as it goes, uh, my father is Gus Keeter which is me, which is three generations away from the traditional Dawes in Rowley, which was my grandmother. Um, we are the wild potato clan. 
And uh, we will talk a little bit more about that. But we're gatherers and we take care of the river bottoms and make sure that people have what they need to eat and food. And, uh, and our clan sign is, and I'm going to show you that in a moment, has a lot of creatures of the land. So uh, we are tribal citizens of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and um, from our homelands in North Carolina. So hopefully today it'll be more you asking questions. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, who uh, I am, not just who I am in uh, Native, but also the business that we do in Indian country with the OCO group. OCO, by the way, and you heard me say CO, is uh, hello in Cherokee. Uh, we have many greetings and it has many meetings. And the Cherokee language is um, broad and um, a derivative of the Algonquin language uh, that uh, as the Cherokees migrated, it's a difficult language to learn. Uh, we also have our own uh, written language as well as spoken. Uh, many tribes don't. They just have a handed down spoken language. But the Cherokee Nation, thanks to Sequoia, both has our syllabary as well as our spoken word, which is, a, is at the heart of our culture. Let me show you a little bit more about our, our tribe. Um, uh, that is our flag, the Cherokee Nation. And as you see, you'll see the seven stars are our seven clans. Uh, we are a reservation due to treaties, not traditional reservations like you might see in South Dakota or North Dakota, we have lands, but we are also a trust land tribe, but our treaties uh, give us the right to Indian country, what was pre-Oklahoma, the state of Oklahoma. We were there uh, because of the removal prior to the state of Oklahoma when it was just Indian country. And here's a bit of trivia. Uh, they tried to call it the state of Sequoia, Sequoia State. So Oklahoma, which is a, a, actually a Choctaw word, uh, was uh, part of the state was going to be broken off and the proposal was there to be called the state of Sequoia because so much of the Cherokee Nation migrated all the way over to the Red River and beyond all the way into Texas and down into San Antonio. So traditionally the native lands were great even after the removal but certainly before the removal, what some people call the Trail of Tears, spanning Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and really a lot of the East Coast. Um, you'll hear people talk about the tri five tribes uh, and, and we'll speak to a little bit of that when I talk to Oklahoma. But welcome to um, my tribe, the Cherokee Nation. And you see here, and I'll, I'll point it out, is the wild potato clan crest. That is, that is our clan sign. Uh, you see the potatoes, you see the g stew, which is rabbit, uh, you see the, the, the turtle, and uh, you see the lizards, all of the things that are protectors of the ground. Now stop me if y'all have any questions or I'll just keep going. I thought maybe a little intro to Indian country, what we call Indian country, the Native American tribes of the United States. Uh, there are 574 federally recognized Indian nations. Um, they are called by many names, uh, tribes, nations, bands, pueblos, communities, villages, uh, and then even within those areas, such as my uh, tribe, they have communities. Um, many of the tribes also have communities or districts within their tribal nations, um, whether they are reservation tribes or pueblos or communities, native villages. The Cherokee Nation is made up of 14 counties in our jurisdictional and traditional areas that were prior to the state of Oklahoma. And then within that, we have communities like Rocky Mountain, Wahilla, uh, Greasy, Dahlonegi, um, many of the traditional names that you that were brought from our homelands and from our traditional language of, of the Cherokees. So tribes have uh, 
a lot of different ways that they are set up, that they govern. They are allowed to choose their governance because they are sovereign, because of their treaty rights that were given to them really as the United States. We were here prior to uh, any of the United States. You know, the preamble of the constitution, we were here before that. <laughs> so uh, we've been here since time immortal, really. There are many different ethic, uh, ethnically diverse types of Native Americans, culturally diverse, linguistically diverse. Um, in, for instance, Alaska, there are uh, 229 different types of native tribal peoples in Alaska. And Alaska is very vast. Uh, and so that's just an example. And um, then in the uh, lower 48, uh, there are some 35 other states that have federally recognized tribes. And Hawaii um, does not have federally recognized tribes, but they have Native Hawaiian organizations uh, that, the, that the government recognizes for certain types of privileges, but uh, they are not federally recognized tribes in Hawaii. So that's kind of some just brief history. I gave Rachel some things that she's going to share with all of you after this session that go into great detail about tribal nations from the National Congress of American Indians. And, and I think it would be uh, interesting for you. You can read so much more than I could ever tell you about the tribal nations and how they're set up within the United States. We even have a seat now on uh, the um, uh, Native uh, Nations internationally. So we think that's pretty cool. So Native Americans in Indian country. Um, Native Americans really are rooted and have evolved really out of our traditions, our distinct, distinct ways of life. Tribal nations have always been and governed in different ways. Um, we are really defined by our peoples, our cultures, our sense of place, um, the land that, um, that we've evolved from in our cultures, the governance systems that we've created for our people and our tribes are unique. And actually um, the United States took a lot of lessons from the native people uh, as to how to set up our government. The Cherokee Nation has um, in our government by our constitution, uh, the administration, the juris, the, the um, uh, legislative and the judicial branch as the United States has. So you'll hear Native American people talk about their their folks, their people, their culture, how they govern and how attached they are to the place and the land. So here's some of my faves. Um, I love contemporary native art. Um, I like all art but uh, of the native people, but these are some of the favorite things that, that, uh, um, that I like in some pieces that I have either gathered, have myself, or just think are very cool. So you see the VW bus, that is over 2 million beads that a Native American artist that is indigenous from uh, the Pueblos of Mexico created and the inside and outside of that uh, VW beetle is all beads. It's all done. It took thousands and thousands of hours for the artist to do that. Um, so I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, when I saw it, it's in the Native American, it was, it was uh, in the Native American uh, Museum in Washington, D.C. If y'all haven't gone to that, that's a special place. Uh, the Native American uh, Smithsonian is unique and something really special. And I would encourage all of you, if you haven't gotten up to D.C. to see it, you should do that. Uh, the other piece of art is done by a Cherokee artist. And uh, that's his... Um, his rendition of uh, going to the stars, the greater being. And I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, and because he was a Cherokee artist, I really like 
in the upper right hand corner of that piece. Uh, and then we're very much tied to our children. And so the, the other artist is a female artist who depicted uh, a mother and her child. And so I thought that was cool. And the last one is throat singing. And that was given to me by an artist in Alaska. And actually Alaska natives do what they call throat singing. And so you can't see it, but at the bottom it's signed by her and given to me. And so I keep that in my office because I think that's a cool rendition of some traditional ways. So you guys have probably seen much native art and much native art is always depicted in teepees and, and uh, you know, big headdresses and that is beautiful. Um, but we have a lot of other native art and I guess the overall message, the takeaways, we're still here and you can see it. Any questions about the stuff right now? I don't read chat very well. So if anybody sees something in chat that I should see, let me know. So I thought being consultants, um, I would talk a little bit about, we are still here. Um, I didn't wanna talk about history and all of that. You can read about that. And I'm not a native historian, uh, I'm a native. And um, I can tell you lots of people who are great native historians and you can read many books about that. So that's not what I'm gonna spend my 45 minutes on. I wanna talk about today and I wanna talk about native business and the native economies and uh, what we do now, and then tell you a little bit about some of the gigs that I, I get to do. And I wanna specifically narrow it down to the Cherokee businesses and the Cherokee nation. So in the last few years, a lot of focus has been around what do the tribes contribute in the way of their tribal economies? I mean, at the end of the day, sovereignty, it's really about taking care of yourself. And sovereignty is the exercise of who we are. That's what we really want to stimulate in the native, uh, in the native tribes is it, it's about taking care of yourself and taking care of your people. So to do that, part of today's society is the economic development and the economies of the regions, the state and the people within our tribal systems. So I thought some of the things that might interest you guys are a few numbers. If any of you are analytical and you like statistics uh, and logic as I do uh, when I'm developing strategy, the Cherokee Nation's economic impact, they did a study with Oklahoma City University. They do it every two years approximately. And in 2019, um, the Cherokee Nation for the regional economy in Oklahoma contributed around about 2 billion to, uh, to the economy in the state of Oklahoma. That's only one tribe. Uh, so if you think about the tribes, and there are 39 tribes in the state of Oklahoma, the five largest tribes are the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Seminole, uh, and they all have thriving businesses uh, economic enterprises, as well as their tourism and casino businesses. And so if you can imagine a microcosm of the Cherokee Nation being one of those contributors to the state of Oklahoma and then to the United States, um, they, in 2019, um, they contributed about $836 million in wages and benefits. You can see over 9,000 direct employees, uh, direct employment in that, really the region, but the state of Oklahoma, and over 31 million in gaming fees to the state. And if you think about the gaming fees, because all of the tribes have compacts with the states that they are in, and they create these gaming contract compacts, they're called, and they negotiate what they're going to contribute back to the state and what that's going to go to as far as the state budget. So in 2019, the state of Oklahoma, all of the tribes, and not all 39 have gaming compacts with the state. So not all tribes choose to be gaming tribes, 
But in Oklahoma, the gaming tribes that have compacts in 2019 contributed over $138 million to the state budget of Oklahoma. And most of that was earmarked for the education funds in the state of Oklahoma. So pretty significant amount of money um, that they contribute to that state. And you can imagine in the other states like Connecticut and New York and um, the Carolinas and Florida, how much those gaming compacts are contributing to those state economies and the national economy by the people that we employ in many different segments and many different industries. Um, the revenue in the Cherokee Nation business enterprises was over $1.1 billion in 2019. And I believe it exceeded 1.8 billion in 2020. Um, they're in 30, they have 36 different companies that they own, that they are wholly owned by the Cherokee Nation as their single ownership group. Um, and so the Cherokee Nation is a single stockholder in the Cherokee Nation business enterprises. Um, and they're in three growth sectors and uh, they're strong and they're vibrant. And the, the businesses, I'd love to be a stockholder of a company that uh, gave this kind of a contribution back. And I guess I am. Uh, the Cherokee Nation businesses, they generated about $728 million in funding, profit funding in the past 10 years to their to the sole shareholder, the Cherokee Nation. Some pretty good returns. The Cherokee Nation then invests that in programs. We don't get as Cherokee Nation citizens what you've probably heard of per cap dividends. Many tribes do that. Uh, they give their tribal citizens dividends off of the monies that the casinos or the enterprises bring into the tribe. Our tribe has chosen not to do that. We invest all of our money back into infrastructure, education, healthcare programs. Um, one of the recent things that we've done is started a medical school in the um, rural medical education. And so Oklahoma State University work with the Cherokee Nation and there's a medical school. So that's pretty cool. So I wanna stop there and I wanna let you guys, cause our time is short, ask a few questions about um, maybe, you know, one or two that you guys might have for me about the native culture, the native business. Yeah, we're still here. We thrive and survive. And that's what we do. I'll lead um, off. Everyone's feeling shy. I and Ronnie, you may be leading into this, but I feel like your your understanding of the culture is probably so helpful in launching your business, which I'm sure you're about to talk about. So I'm just curious, and maybe this is a good transition question what for you was the catalyst between just sort of maybe anecdotally giving advice or, or sort of seeing these businesses in practice and sort of what, what was the catalyst to you to say, I'm going to formally consult and, and make the difference in native, organ, in native organizations with this firm? I'm kind of curious what the moment was for you that launched your group. Wow, great question. Um, so my background is in, is in business. Um, I ended up in Dallas out of college, and I didn't really tell you all my story. Uh, it's probably less important, but, uh, and natives don't generally do that. Um, they, we don't lead with who we are. We lead with what, what we can give. Um, but my background out of college, I ended up in Dallas in, in business and started out and just really started out to learn. Uh, my degrees in political science, liberal arts, uh, so not an MBA in business. Uh, but a uh, grounded in the, the ideas of, of listening and learning and um, talking with people about who they are and what they do. And so coming from a small town, coming to Dallas, you know, I listened a lot about people would say, if you do this, you'll be really good. 
Um, and so I tried to do that and a little bit more. So I was really fortunate and blessed to fall into some great jobs with amazing companies uh, in the Fortune 50, Fortune 5 um, arenas. I um, have worked some with some very good mentors and cultures and got to very early on in my career work with General Electric and Motorola and Northern Telecom and um, AT&T and Convex Computers and Anderson Consulting, Accenture uh, now, and um, Pillsbury Burger King, Diageo. Uh, and I've been in both IPOs, publicly held companies. I've learned from entrepreneurs to engineers to CEOs of amazing conglomerates how to do things and how not to do things. And um, I had to sit in boardrooms pretty early in my career and try to understand what was the most important, kind of most impactful things that people, that resonate with people. And what I found is a lot of it's just babble. <laughs> a lot of it's just show. Um, and the smartest people in the room were the people who were more intelligent about the context and the dynamics and kind of the emotional intelligence of what was happening, who it was happening with, and getting down to the essence of solving the problem. And that's how Native people think. Um, and so, and looking at it for the good of all, as opposed to the good of one. So what I saw um, and what I've learned is we call it gadugi, which is, is really, it's teamwork. That's, that's kind of what it is. Um, but it's, it's working for the good of all or the good of the whole. And that is really kind of when I started my career, I didn't know any better. And that, that I think is, is the essence of what we all need to do. When I stop and think about OCO, um, I was in a big, big player. Uh, I loved my company. Diageo uh, held on the London and New York Stock Exchange, um, multi-billion dollar entity. When I was uh, first started, we owned Pillsbury and Burger King. Um, we decoupled, but we made lips smile. That's what we did. Uh, that's what that's what we, they called it. We the Pillsbury Doughboy was my friend, as well as Burger King, the King, uh, and Diageo. Uh, you all will know it by our brands. Uh, we own the top shelf of any bar that you go into anywhere in the world. Uh, we own Guinness. We own Bailey's. We own. Um, we bought Seagrams all while I was there as a corporate executive within um, Diageo. And they called us, my role, Vice President of Business Capabilities. Well, I didn't really know what that was when I took that job, um, but I knew that I had my own canvas. Um, and it was to take the consumer insights and be the person that rolled everything we had around the people strategy of the way you deliver your brands and the way you build your brands and the way that you deliver the work is through engagement of your people. So my whole job was to make sure that all of our strategies and executives and everything we did was wrapped around our people strategy. And so that the talents of our people and the engagements of our people drove the growth of the company. So I thought that was a pretty cool job. Uh, and it was, I could tell you down to the case the return on investment based on the people, for instance, that you had in that region, how long a region was open for a salesperson, the talents of that salesperson, what capabilities they needed. And I could go down to uh, a margin based and align it to the people in those groups. So the people strategies to me and the organizational development of structures and companies 
are kind of what drove me in big business. And that was my, I guess, core competence um, was change management and organizational strategy by design. And so when the company got to a point where at the C-suite, your values or your beliefs no longer align, maybe, or it's time for you to do something different and you're on a strategic blueprint team that's redesigning how the organization looks. Sometimes you have the novelty of creating yourself uh, out of a job. And so that's what I got to do. Uh, my job didn't really need to be there anymore um, in the broader context. And I actually was ready to move on, but I didn't think I wanted to go back into big corporate America and drive that anymore because I believe the higher you go, sometimes the, the less impact you have in certain ways. So when I stopped and decided what I wanted to do with my life uh, as about a 40-year-old uh, executive, I had done a lot of things, fun, wonderful, great things that I'm so blessed to have done, learned from it wasn't going big again. It was actually going small. And being a catalyst for people to define their own purpose and to be very purposeful and go back to my roots of Stillwell, Oklahoma, back to kind of the essence of how Native people work and the work that they do. And also I looked at the niches and there was a missing niche in Indian country in native business to business consulting. And I've been in consulting with General Electric, with Anderson Consulting, with many others. I mean, that's what I did for so many years. I sold consulting, I delivered consulting, I did what you do uh, and I loved it. And then I hated it at the same time. Uh, and so you guys know that drill, but I wanted to do it differently. I, I wanted to do it one client at a time I wanted to be a boutique consulting firm and OCO is just that. So I was pretty purpose driven. Some people might call it a fire starter, a flint starter. I just wanted to be um, a catalyst or an engine for, for Native American people, organizations, groups or groups that work with them to help them find their path in the best way, but it's their path. It's not some path that people tell them they have to have. So that's why I think OCO and hello is a greeting. Hello is communications. So my business partner and I, Leanne McGee, who I grew up with in Stillwell, she had worked uh, for our tribe in Washington, DC. We decided in 2003 that communications is really what business is about. And OCO is the number one greeting that people know in Indian country. Uh, believe it or not. So OCO Group, that's who we are. Actually, our formal name is OCO Communications LLC, um, but the OCO Group is who we are. And we have a small group of wonderful consultants that go out and do, do the work. Most of them are uh, Native or have worked in Native organizations um, and are fairly seasoned in that kind of work. And that's why we started OCO. So thank you for that question, Rachel. I hope I answered it with a long-winded answer. Yes, that was great. And there's actually a great question in the chat if you are open to another being fired off. Yeah, please. Will you read uh, it to me? Yeah, absolutely. Young asked, what are some, oh, sorry, I hear my own echo. What are some unique or unusual challenges that OCO comes across and helps to solve? Oh, wow. You just led me to what I want to talk to you about, my gigs. <laughs> That's a wonderful question. Um, sometimes it's complicated in Indian country. It's really complicated. Um, the tribal governments, for instance, I'll give you a for instance why it's complicated. We do a lot of work in, in Alaska. We do a lot of work with Alaska Native organizations. In Alaska, in village, because of the way the federal government set them up, they have Alaska Native corporations, which are set up just like corporations in the lower 48 or corporations internationally, they have stockholders 
their stockholders are their native village people that are blood quantum natives. Uh, and in the 70s, they set up the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, the federal government did. So instead of reservations, they gave them a corporation and they gave them money and they gave them, a, them land and they called them Alaska Native Corps. The only difference is you can't give away your stock. You can't sell your stock. Once you're a stockholder within the Native Corporation, you're in it for life unless you die, and then you can only give your stock to a descendant who is also of native descent and native blood. So that is one entity. They also have village um, like cities. So they have village municipalities, they have boroughs. So like our uh, counties, they have state government and they have federal entities and they have regional corporations. So some of the villages have up to six different types of governing entities that govern a village of 500 people. So when you go into Alaska, for instance, and we work with many of their native corporations, which are businesses, and their businesses have multiple different sectors, entities. Uh, for instance, Chugach, Alaska is one of our clients. Um, and they are a multi-billion dollar entity with over 60 subsidiary companies in four different sectors that they work in. And they are just like a privately held corporation because they're stockholders and they have to give their stockholders dividends. So just like an outside company, they're a for-profit corporation with a for-profit board. And we work with those boards, but the unique thing about an Alaska Native Corporation board, unlike Diageo's board or IBM's board or any of the other big corporations boards, they are elected and they have a unique purpose. So their shareholders elect their board members and yet they are supposed to completely be a for-profit board. So they're uniquely and that's the only board in the country that is set up like that. So they govern a for-profit corporation and they are elected governing bodies by the people who own the stock in the corporation. Very unique thing. So when I go into work with those boards of directors, which we do, the majority of our work with OCO is at the C-suite and board level. And all of our work is by referral. Um, the work that we do over the years, you, we have a light footprint, we call it. We want our clients, we, are, we serve our clients one client at a time and we contribute value. And that value that we contribute lends us to our next piece of work. Um, Tikiak Corporation, for instance, and you talk about complicated, they're one of those that have five different governing bodies. Tikiak is Point Hope, Alaska. It's the furthest point uh, in Alaska. It is a village that has been around for the millennia. They are whaling people. Tikiak Corporation was our first client in 2003. I made my first trip out to the Arctic uh, in a whiteout blizzard, got stuck in Kotzebue uh, and taking a uh, bush plane trying to get into Point Hope and um, do work with them in 2003. And I just finished uh, three weeks ago doing their strategic plan for 2021 to 2023. They have been a client since 2003. Our clients are our friends. Our clients are more than a client to us. Um, so we tend to value that relationship above all else. So complicated, yes, but if you use your heart smarts with clients in Indian country, it goes much, much further uh, than when you work in big business. But I would argue in biz big business it works too, because Indian country is big business. Uh, native business is big business. So complicated, because of the 
unique governing entities within Indian country, complicated because they feel so connected to the people that they need to make money for. So their businesses or their programs are set up for such a unique purpose that in, in native businesses, it's harder to take the harsh stand on, we only do this for business. And yet I always have to be the one to point out sometimes, okay, you guys, you have to separate. Here's what the business is telling you. Here's what the data, here's what the numbers, here's the path that this is on. It's not trending right. What do we do about that? But the considerations are about the well being of all. So that makes it more difficult. It sometimes is a slower pace than oftentimes I was used to in the realities of business. And yet we still have to go at a record pace. It's an ever changing world, just like what you see. But the uniqueness is you lead with the relationships. And I would never go into a group and not get to know their place, their people, and their culture first before I ever tried to solve with them their path forward. So that's different about Indian country consulting. And that's what OCO is about. It's helping them find purposeful solutions for the path that they want to be on. You want to hear about some of the gigs I get to do? I'm taking that as a yes. <laughs> so this is one of the groups that uh, I work with. And in fact, uh, next week I'll be flying out to Ketchikan to do review the game plans for their strategic plan with their tribal council and their uh, leadership group for um, the work that we have done on their strategic plan. They are the tribe of Ketchikan, Alaska. Um, Indian community, and they are um, uh, Haida uh, Clinket people of the southeast part of the uh, state of Alaska. And again, they have been there forever. Uh, you see some of their regalia. I want to show you their strategic plan. This is public knowledge. I'm not showing you anything that isn't on their website. Um, we started this work in 2018 with them with their tribal council and uh, their leadership group and their uh, departments trying to decide how they wanted their vision to go forward for the next, they say, 20, 30 millennial years. So when they talk about visions and when we do visioning with these councils or boards or their people, and we do visioning differently. They do it with Crayola crayons and a piece of uh, tablet paper that they draw on. We do it with the youth. We do it with the elders. We do it with the business council. We do it with the boards. Um, and all of that comes together and they tell their stories before they ever look at their visions. And I'll show you one that I keep on my wall. I don't know if y'all can see this, but this was a drawing that one of the board members did uh, for his vision of what Tikiak, the village of Point Hope, would be if they had everything they could possibly want and everything they needed. Um, so we vision in a different way. Our time is up, that was my timer. So um, I don't know if we can go over or if you wanna go about five more minutes. You want me just to run through these real quickly, Rachel? What do you wanna do? I would say, Ronnie, if you have five more minutes, we would be, be more than happy to, to have you close out this, this story. Um, folks, if you have to drop, we will certainly send around the recording. I know no. um, some people are probably booked right at the 45, but if you have five minutes, Ronnie, we'd love to have you continue. Um, and I have as much time as you need. I put two hours on my calendar. So 
Um, this is their this is their strategic plan. They call it the house post because house posts hold up their um, uh, round their house uh, and their traditional house that everyone did their governing in. So they do strategic plans just like everybody else. They have a unique purpose that they defined their promise and their work culture. So this is more sit and sock native corporation. We did their strategic plan in a BIA uh, school, an old BIA school out in Nome. And one of the village board members had to land in an airplane. So it's very different. Um, the way that we work is a very different way of doing things. Uh, and it's very grounded in the people, the places uh, that they are, where they come from. and their culture and heritage. So um, we work with them to do things just like you do, but just in a bit different way. Um, this, as you see, this is the village of Wales and I'll, I'll finish on this. This was work that I did. They don't have sewer and water. So I stayed in their IRA. What you see over there, the sled is how the kids get to school in the mornings. That's their school bus. And uh, we did leadership training and work and the kids came and did a dance for me uh, while I was staying there in Wales, Alaska. And uh, we, I was doing adjunct work for the University of Alaska Fairbanks doing leadership development and they brought in their high school students uh, to be a part of this. So it's a wonderful life that I get to lead in the consulting work that I do. And it's a nice way to make a living. And the native groups today, again, we're still here, we're thriving and, um, the native people are doing great things in uh, in their world today. So I thank you, Wado, for your time, and uh, and I will be here. I will stay on as long as you guys have questions. Any questions for Ronnie? I had one actually. Um, I was just going to ask. So, I know that the uh, federal government offers significant incentives to have native-owned businesses um, basically involved in federal contracting. Uh, could you explain, you know, what the incentives are to having native citizens as a, you know, majority owner as they're working with the federal government? Yeah. Thanks, Alec. Good question. So. Um, as natives and any minority in the U.S. Um, has a special small business um, set aside advantage for doing contracting work with the federal government. It's a large part of the growing, the, one of the fastest growing segments in um, Native American businesses today. Um, the tribes and the Alaska Native Corporations can own multiple businesses with what they call an eight, the number eight A, um, status that is a certification given by the Small Business Administration. Because they are minority owned by the tribe, um, they can have multiple 8A businesses, which is a certification, and they can get sole source non-compete contracts in the federal space um, with agencies as well as the DOD. And many of the native owned businesses do millions and millions of dollars worth of business in the federal government contracting arena right now to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. They, um, that segment of work because of their 8A set aside non-compete and now they have 8A compete, they have a unique uh, way of a vehicle, they call it, and any of you that have ever worked in the federal market, there are multiple different vehicles that you can use to get federal contracts. The 8A status and the sole source non-compete, you still have to meet all the requirements for the specific RFP or work that they are putting out, but you can get that work as a sole source provider. Native American individuals like Alec or myself can actually get our own 8A as an entrepreneur, but only one in our lifetime. And the program is meant to stimulate entrepreneurs to get bigger and better and graduate as a larger company. So there are specific requirements of the number of employees to graduate out of the 8A program, as well as revenue 
targets that once you've hit that scale in your business, you're no longer considered a small disadvantaged 8A business. You've proudly graduated from the 8A program and then you move on. You still may be a small business, but not small enough to meet the 8A program standards. Um, but a tribe or a native corporation, an ANC, because they represent hundreds of thousands. For instance, the Cherokee Nation has close to 400,000 tribal citizens. They can have multiple 8As. Um, so they can restart 8A businesses in different NAICS code segments. So they may have as many as 10 to 12 to 15 8A businesses at any one time in separate segments of the government contracting arena. And then size codes are specified based on their NAICS code. And they make great money and good profit that they return back to their shareholders because of that work. So it's been a wonderful vehicle mm -hmm. for the native corporations and the business enterprises of the tribes and minority owned people to start up their small businesses. Thanks for that question, Alex. Good yeah, question. So long story short, it sounds like it's a good idea to have a native like co-founder as well, because that can put you on the hot list for federal like contracting or basically you can get preferential treatment in these RFPs. So yeah, really interesting. Yeah. And they do that. There's a lot of joint ventures that they do. But again, you have to be really careful, as you all know, you got to be careful who you, who you hop in bed with. So we do a lot of consulting around the JVs um, and being very careful about their mentor protégés and the JV agreements and how they go into acquisitions and mergers. We do that very carefully in Indian country because it's very easy to take care of small on to take advantage of entrepreneurial situations just for the sake of the mentor making more than the protege. And that's not what you want to do or the JV not being a good split of 51, 49 or 60, 40. So we're very careful when we do advice, when we go in to do health check assessments or mergers and acquisition looks to make sure that the tribal entity or the individual is, is the primary and doing what they're supposed to do to meet those requirements. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, any other questions for Ronnie? I know we're coming up on the hour. Awesome. Well, Ronnie, thank you so, so much for joining us. That was awesome, super informative um, to everyone on the line. Ronnie referenced it, but we'll make sure we, we share all the materials that Ronnie shared with us. Um, so if you're if you're feeling inspired to do some more reading like I am. Um, Ronnie, Ronnie has pointed us in the right direction. So big, big thank you. And again, thank you to Shelby and Allie and Alec, our special guest, you get a shout out as well. Um, but we will pass along all of the resources so folks can continue to learn um, and hope to, hope to see Ronnie back someday soon, perhaps. Thank you and um, welcome any questions or anything that you guys ever wanna ask. And if I can be of service, I'm here. Thanks guys, appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.